welcome to another Q&A session for the best club in history, Real Madrid, hosted by Gael Manny. This is a Madridismo.org production. Um, hi everybody and welcome. Um, I have one word for you. Seven. We are seven points ahead of Barca in the Liga, which I guess kind of makes up for the events earlier this week. Uh, so what we're going to do in this Q&A is we're going to start discussing the Copa del Rey because I guess there's plenty to say, although I wasn't too much in the mood for it on Thursday. Um, and then we'll finish with uh, last night's game. So to, today we have uh, Aaron and Tanush to discuss the game with the games with us. Hi, guys. Hey there. Hey. And so... To talk about the Copa del Rey, I would like to start with Tanush because <laughs> he was very disappointed that we ended up not having any Q and A for for the game on uh, on Tuesday on Wednesday. So go ahead, tell me all the things you wanted to say, all the things you wanted to share. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I was more disappointed with the first half performance and the fact that. Uh, that we had to do this uh, podcast if we won but since we didn't we didn't do the Q&A so I was doubly disappointed I would say <laughs> but uh, I, I was I mean I, I, I felt better after our second half display in the Copa del Rey so I think overall overall I think it was fine but uh, it would have been very difficult to bear if uh, the first half performance had continued into the second half as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was I was disappointed. I mean, there were good things about the game, so sure we could have had the Q and A, but I was so not in the mood that I thought, mm, you know, it's better to let some time pass and and then see what happens. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, Aaron, what about you? Um, you know, I, I kind of follow the, the typical line of thinking, I think, from the Madridistas, at least the ones that I've talked to. I was I was pleased with the match. I was disappointed that we weren't able to win. I was disappointed that we weren't able to progress. But the fact of the matter is that the Copa del Rey is the least important challenge that we're facing this season. I mean, besides maybe the Supercopa. I can't think of anything I care about less than the Copa del Rey. Uh, I know that was the one that we won last year, and it was nice because it's been so long since we won it. But you know what? It, in the grand scheme of things, it's got nothing on La Liga. It's got nothing in the Champions League. So if that's the one we miss out to due to uh, inability to put away our chances and not playing Barcelona tough for 180 minutes, that's fine. I will accept that uh, as long as we get those trophies in La Liga and the Champions League. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that was what people were saying, right? We've been pretending for, I don't know, like, what, six months, nine months, that Copa del Rey was a big deal, but really it's not that much, so... Okay, uh, so let's continue with what I would call the controversial topics. I usually don't like to get too much into controversy because I prefer to discuss football, per se, but I guess some people actually like it. And also maybe my opinion is, um, you know, it's biased. So it's good to, to see if, if you guys have another um, point of view on those topics. So I just go and name them and you tell me, you know, uh, if you think it's worth discussing or if you think it's not. Uh, first of all, Mourinho's attitude. Um, after he was booed against, I think it was at the end of the game, uh, the Athletic, um, he basically yeah. said that, uh, yeah, you know, it's no big deal. He was kind of like shaking it off and uh, and saying that he wasn't a Madridista anyway. Uh, he was a professional. He was doing his job with Madrid, of course. But in the end, he's not a Madridista. And I don't know. It really felt like a slap in our face. I thought it he could have saved that comment. So I wanted to know what you thought about that. Well, for me, Mourinho is Mourinho. You know, he doesn't pull any punches, and I've never been under the estimation that, you know, he is a diehard Madridista. I, you know, he he's a professional. He's come in here to do a job. I expect him to have passion about his job, uh, which 
isn't really a problem with Mourinho, you know. He's not the kind of guy that you're worried about just coming in and phoning it in. So, I, you know, he was just being honest. Uh, I have trouble faulting him for that. Okay. Um, I I don't think uh, he was being he was insulting the Madridistas. It was just I think he was being honest because uh, when he was booed, it was it was a mixed sort of a response. Some some section of the fans were chanting his name, while there was another section of the fans who were booing. Uh, so there were more uh, chants of Aitor's name rather than of uh, Mourinho, which is. Uh, so unlike what have what we have seen this season, so I I don't think he was being disrespectful. He was just being honest because we ha- the sections of the fans have indeed booed Zidane, Ronaldo, and many other legends in the past. Okay, okay. I just thought it was kind of weird coming from him now. You know, since he's coaching Real Madrid, because you don't I don't think you hear any players like let's say Cristiano. Or whoever we know that they might leave at some point, and you don't hear them say, "Well, I'm not a Madridista anyway." <laughs> so I don't know. I thought it was a bit weird, but yeah. Yeah, that is. I mean, it's kind of weird, but that's just the nature of the game, you know. Like it's it's acceptable if our coaches, if our bosses are are sort of uh, indifferent to the team more or less and more transient. But we always want our players to, you know, defend that crest with their very souls. So, I mean. I don't know. Like I said, it's it's Mourinho being Mourinho, and it seems really silly to ever be disappointed in Mourinho for speaking his mouth because that's like, you know, expecting a dog not to wag its tail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of defending the crest, did you see Pepe um, k- kissing the, his the crest on his uh, jersey at the end of the game? At the end of the game, uh, the Barca, I mean. Uh, did you see that? Yep, yep, I saw the pictures. That was very passionate and full of rage at the same time. So that leads me to ask you what you thought of his behavior. Um, I know people, I know Aaron, you were disappointed. Well, I don't know if disappointed or you thought it wasn't right anyway. Um, I know Ali also wasn't happy with it. Uh, so yeah, what would you guys think? Uh, Tanis, you want to go first? Uh, okay. I think uh, his actions in the first leg were very disappointing for a Madridista to handle. Uh, mostly because if you think about it as a neutral perspective and in a rational sense, he was just, whatever he did was just not right. But in the second leg, he he was a stellar performer. I mean, he performed really well. He defended well. And there was no controversy coming from his end. He got a yellow card, yes, but he didn't deserve it, I think. And But as far as controversies go, in the second leg, there was nothing from him to even be put, on, put a blame on him. Okay. I don't quite agree with that. I call it diving in the second leg as well um you know yes i'm disappointed in him for the stamping incident obviously because i don't think you know players should be doing that to other players no matter how upset you are no matter how much they've been doing those niggling off the ball fouls because you know like that's the same game where messi basically destroyed contrao on a dead ball situation you know the play had been stopped and messi just jumps right in the contrao and you know nothing yeah. happened so, uh, you know, like I said in my article, I can I can see where Pepe is coming from, but I'm not going to defend him still because, you know, he's he's an adult. He should be able to make better decisions than that. And what was extra damaging to our reputation was not just that he was doing that kind of thuggish behavior but that he was diving as well that you know he was on the ground clutching his face he was doing the sort of stuff that we associate with barcelona and granted or di maria (laughs) or di maria yeah as well i mean those that's the kind of stuff that i don't want associated with real madrid i will accept hard fouls those are a part of the game they're written into the rules when you get caught doing that you get cards you get ejected 
the diving and you know the the simulation of injuries and all that that's not a part of the game at all that's that's conning the system that's working outside of the rules and that's just unacceptable to me you know when he was kissing the crest i don't know how much of it was devotion and dedication to real madrid and how much of it was just him trying to be you know a, a forum troll to the to the barcelona fans trying to get them riled up trying to to express his anger and frustration you know because yeah, exactly I, that's why i chose that image because i think it it sums up really you know his whole um psychology on the field too i think yeah i mean clearly he has got uh the kind of rage and aggression that would put ramos to shame you know <laughs> but at, at the end of the day he is one of the best defenders in the world as long as he's not, you know, getting horribly out of position or having a bad day. But on his day, he's one of the best defenders in the world. I don't know if, if that's enough to warrant a spot on our team, but for better or for worse, he's on our team. So, and he's probably not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, I quite, I quite, sorry to uh, interrupt, but I quite disagree with one aspect of it. Um, I, he was he he fell down uh, clutching his face on one incident I think where uh, Messi was the one who fouled him and uh, I I've not seen the video footage of it but from what I read about it I think uh, it it was a fa it was a fair challenge and uh, he shouldn't have fell I mean. There was no reason for him to go down clutching his face, but then again, it was a foul indeed. And as far as uh, kissing his uh, crest is concerned, if if you're trying to get uh, under the Barca fan Barca fans' skin, then a part of you is already a madridista. I mean, <laughs> you if you're if you're really passionate about the club, then only will you do that. I, if you if you if you do not do that, then you're really not passionate about the club in, enough. That's what, at least, that's what uh, I infer from it. Uh, okay. I don't know. There's there's different ways to get under their skin. You know, I would personally prefer beating them on the field. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, clearly, clearly, that's not obviously uh, always a possibility. But I, for for me, it just strikes me as I don't know how much of it is Pepe dedicated to the club and how much of it is Pepe, Pepe trying to be a jerk? Because uh, he strikes me as the kind of guy that is, you know, totally fantastic with all of his friends. You know, you see the video from training. You see the video, uh, you know, when they're scoring goals. You see the video before the game. He just seems like, you know, such an awesome guy to hang around with until he's your enemy. And then he's going to be one of the most obnoxious guys in the world. So... Uh, you know, yes, there was the foul that Messi, uh, that Messi uh, committed on Pepe, got him on the back leg. It was absolutely ridiculous. It was There was no reason for that foul whatsoever. He was clearly not going after the ball. Uh, he was just lashing out at Pepe, and that's kind of been swept under the rug. Uh, because, you know what, he got a yellow card, and that's how the game handles fouls, so... I, I guess for better or for worse, we don't talk about that anymore. But the fact of the matter is that wasn't the only time he went down to the ground. Um, the last time we faced Barcelona, I, I counted about two, three, maybe even four times that he was on the ground sort of writhing in mock pain, I suppose. And like I said, uh, you know, maybe he's just picking up the slack for Di Maria because you know <laughs> Di Maria's out hurt. But I don't, I don't want that from my team. I want a team with class. You know, I don't want a team that's going to win at all costs. Okay, I just have to say something uh, for his defense because we we um, quote unquote met him once. Well, we didn't talk to him, so I guess it's not really meeting him. But we were very close to him for. Uh, several minutes, like 10 or 15 minutes, and it was at an event for Real Madrid Foundation, and he was there because they were do having the event for a school in, um, I don't know how you pronounce that in English, uh, Mozambique, how do you say, Mozambique? Yeah, Mozambique. 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 So yeah. they, they speak Portuguese, right? So I think he was there, well, 
to speak Portuguese with the people who were there too. And the journalist really cared more about him than about the, you know, the other people in the project. And they were always trying to get him into all the pictures. And he was very shy about it because he realized that he wasn't really there. He wasn't the, the protagonist. And so he was like, mm, I don't know. And so they would be like, Pepe, Pepe, go to the picture, like shouting at him. And he always had this smile and trying to please the journalist, but also stay behind a little bit because it wasn't uh, his spotlight that day. And I don't know, he, he looked really, really nice and shy. And I don't know. So I always have a hard time picturing him as a murderer or whatever names is being called because I remember that day and I know other people like Javi and Juan Pablo from the team who were there that day too always remember that as well and we weren't sitting together or anything we were all scattered over the room but we all had the same impression so yeah that's it that was my little defense of Pepe <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure you won't get a defense from Casquero of Pepe. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Casquero won't have nice words to say of Pepe. Oh uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, that's everybody's different experience of him, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, like I was trying to say before, you know, I don't think he's a bad person. I just think he's not the kind of guy you want to make an enemy of. You know, those, those, the, what was it, a, a school from Mozambique? Yes. That they were raising yeah. money for? Yeah, yeah, those school school children better make sure they never make enemies with Pepe. <laughs> <laughs> Poor, no, but, no, shh, <laughs> no, no, no. I won't be editing that, but shh. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, like I said, he seems like a, a, a fantastic personality. Just, he's, he's got a, He's got to calm it down a notch, you know? He can't be going all cascaro and all messy over people. Even though, you know, at the end of the day, some of the stuff is is pretty overblown. Like, you know, the, the stamp on the hand, he didn't break Messi's hand. He probably barely bruised Messi's hand. You know, with yeah. cascaro, he, he, you know, he didn't break any bones. He probably didn't draw any blood. There maybe was a bruise. But at the end of the day, like, this is relatively minor stuff. This isn't like he's, you know knifing someone in an alley kind of like how journalists like to portray it yes exactly yeah i agree okay so speaking about of journalists um the (laughs) marca gate let's say let's call it like that uh with supposedly a conversation between ramos and Mourinho, uh harsh words between the two and how uh tanuj you were talking about that i read your latest post this morning morning You said that um, Mourinho was rumored to leave after summer, whatever the outcome of Liga and whatever competition. So um, what what did you think of the whole topic about division in the squad and everything and Mourinho set to leave later this year? Tanush, maybe you want to go first since you wrote about that also? Um. Firstly, let me comment about uh, uh, Mourinho leaving in the summer. Uh, the only reason I half believe it is because it's coming from a credible source, working for a credible uh, newspaper. And there is, otherwise, uh, us had also uh, reported about this last year as well, with uh, Mourinho will leave in the summer, but obviously he didn't. But this time it has just gathered more momentum and and become part of the English media as well because he's rumored to be uh, in coming to England again. Okay. So that's the only possible reason I would half believe it. Not that English media is completely um, uh, completely perfect as well, but better than Spanish media, just in my opinion. <laughs> um, and as for uh, as for the division in the squad is concerned, I think it's complete nonsense. Uh, because I would I, I would just say what Ramos said there if he's coming out and saying that there is no division, then that means there is no division. Otherwise, he won't have any reason to come out and uh, and and just cancel those rumors. Uh, I mean, there is no reason, there is no sense behind it. Okay. 
nothing behind it uh, in my opinion. Okay. Personally, I think the English media is even worse than the Spanish media and doubly <laughs> so when the English media is reporting on Spanish football. So I don't give that report any any credence at all. Uh, I've kind of been avoiding most of Mourinho gate. You know, I, I didn't even read the stories about the row. Wasn't it uh, Ramos and Casillas and yes. some other senior – uh, Spanish Madrid player. Yes, uh, you know, I can I can see them getting frustrated, especially after our you know our first match against Barcelona, which is when this was coming out. But at the end of the day, you know I, I think everyone has a common goal on this team, and that's to win. I think from Mourinho to Ramos to Ronaldo to Pepe to Ozil, everyone wants to win on this team, and when you share a common goal then even when conflict comes up like this, it doesn't last. Okay, yeah, that's what I think too. Maybe it, maybe it was true, but it was like temporary because of the situation, not a real deep uh, division. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, you see, you see problems like this, like, um, who was it, a uh, famous Barcelona player, Dutch, uh, Ronald Koeman was the uh, yeah. coach of Valencia a couple seasons back, and he had pretty much a mutiny on his hands. And it, it, his team pretty much ground to a halt. And that was because they had fundamentally different ideas. I think the Valencia players were more concerned about their team and winning in general. And Komen was more concerned about establishing authority and having a particular hierarchy. And that didn't work out at all for them because they didn't share that goal. But with Madrid and with Mourinho... It's winning first. And sometimes that's not for the best. You get things like, you know, diving and simulation and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, at least it's going to help patch over a lot of rough spots that Mourinho's personality is guaranteed to create. Okay. All right. Um, next topic, the refereeing. Um, I've read and heard some people saying the ref was a disgrace in Copa del Rey, I mean, or in the second leg. And, you know, we had a goal canceled, um, Ramos out and stuff like that. And other people said, well, yeah, but let's not just always make it all come down to refereeing. We were, we, you know, what if in the first leg we had played differently? So I know, Aaron, you don't like me saying what if, <laughs> but that's why I'm saying it. <laughs> so I would like to know your opinion on the refereeing. I personally thought that, yes, there were mistakes, but I felt there were mistakes for both sides anyway. So it was pretty much leveled out. Don't throw tomatoes at me, please. <laughs> <laughs> No, I thought there were definitely mistakes from both sides. Um, you know, I thought maybe the mistakes going against Madrid were a little more grave, but I don't think it was anything worth, you know, saying, oh, the referee cost us the game. You know, clearly it was the fact that we weren't able to take our chances effectively, especially in that first half, that we let them score those two goals. You know, that, that entire series could have been won in that second game. Like, I don't even have to go back to the first game and say, what if we had played that better? If we had played that second game better, it wouldn't have been uh, an issue at all. Uh, there was one decision that I was really, really upset with. Um, most of them, uh, you know, I can, I can see making the wrong calls, uh, you know, giving Ramos a red card. I could see that. I don't think it was the right call, but I could see getting conned by Busquets. Uh, you know, taking away Ramos's goal from Alves's dive, I'm I'm fairly confident that Danny Alves dove uh, on that on that uh, was it a free kick that came in that that Ramos headed home that was called back, but it was the very end of the match. The yeah. referee called the ball back for a free kick, and then the game was delayed for, you know, five, ten seconds while they were getting the ball back and then called it before we even had a chance to take that free kick. Yeah. In my mind, that's terrible refereeing because that's not playing advantage. You know, if a team has to score a goal, you know, it's not like, you know, we're, we're tied up in a regular league match and we could get scored on and maybe we'll lose a point there. You know, we have to score a goal. He knows that. And he calls the ball back. And you should never 
penalize a team for being fouled, and that's what it felt like. You know, I I feel like there probably should have been more stoppage time, but that's one of those things that you know, it's really easy to second guess a referee on. But that the way the game actually ended left a very sour taste in my mouth, and it's impossible to give the referee the benefit of the doubt on that. Did it cost us the game? Absolutely not. But that's why I'm going to criticize this ref. Okay, Tanur. Uh, I completely and hundred percent agree with what Aaron just said. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, there obviously there were reasons uh, where the referee cost us the game, but I I think the this discussion won't have been it won't have even been uh, necessary had we had taken our chances in the first half. I mean. Higuain missed the chance after 10, 20 seconds. Uh, And then there were plenty of chances to score and we didn't convert them. So the referee is to blame, of course. But are we to blame as well? Yes, probably more than the referee because we have to take our chances. The referee will... uh, Let's assume the referee had a great game. Then would we have won even then? I'm not really sure because Barca would have uh, would have probably had more chances as well mm-hmm. because there were there were some things which were called in their favor in uh, our favor as well. So, but I, I, oh, in the end, I would say that uh, referee did cost us, but we were we were more to blame as well. Okay, yeah, I agree. The only thing that still bugs me a little bit is because I I didn't notice that, but I read it on Twitter and then I checked and it happens to be true. Um, It was Alves' goal, right? The second one for Barca was Alves. He scored uh, past the extra time of the first half. So so they they can score past the extra time, but we are denied this um, extra, extra time, let's say. Who knows what would have happened? Probably nothing, but hey, we never know. So that's kind of the thing that, yeah, I guess that's a bit what you were saying also, Aaron. Um, what I, where I think the ref was unfair, that he allowed extra, extra, extra time to them and not to us. But I don't think he did it on purpose. So one I reason mean, I think, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, all I was going to say is at the end of the day, the most you can ask from a ref is consistently. You know, even if they're making bad calls, as long as they're consistent about their bad calls all night long, then you got to just abide it. You know, if something is a handball for one team, it has to be a handball for the other. And there's a very clear example of how one team gets extra time and the other team does not. And that is just, that's a cardinal sin. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what I was going to say was uh, one reason I think that Barcelona would, were allowed to continue beyond uh, stoppage time was because they were near uh, the penalty box. So that was more in an attacking position than what we were in ra- near the halfway line with a free kick. But then again, he just called uh, the full time whistle right at the right at on the full time whistle yeah. there was no extension even though we could have attacked as well and uh, but then again the only reason i think they were allowed was because they were near the penalty box okay i mean it's, it's trivial to send a ball in from midfield into the box on a free kick though you know yeah 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 it's true and also well also uh, alves had been wasting so much time that's why that's my tainted mm-hmm. opinion, maybe, but I, we were like, oh, Alves, come on, get up already. What are you doing? And so, yeah, then most of the extra time goes on, goes by uh, with Alves on the ground. So Yeah, it's, it's always really disappointing when the referees let players get away with that because, you know, there's certain ways of, of time killing that are more or less have to be acceptable, you know, taking it up extra couple seconds on on dead balls you know that's just part of the game but feigning injury shouldn't be part of the game at all and i would really 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 like to see refs be a little more serious about adding on additional extra time to make up for that sort of behavior because it has to be punished you know we can't let these players keep doing that yeah that's neither here nor there 
<laughs> one thing i've noticed which happens only in spain from from the football that i see is uh is when one one team which wants a point or which wants a win and tries to delay a game is by is when the ball boys actually delay in passing the ball back when there is a th- when there is a throw in or a goal kick yeah so that's yeah. that's and that happened quite a lot last season okay so i i, I don't really know because i only watch uh well, i mean uh, spanish football for national leagues uh but yeah and that was the problem that was criticized uh, last Wednesday as well. So, hmm. well, the other thing they do is the uh, the ball boys will put another ball on the pitch right before the ball gets put into play. So, you know, one of the uh, one of one of the away team will have the ball to throw it in, and one of the ball boys will accidentally let a ball go on the pitch, and of course, yeah. play has to stop. You have to get the ball off the yeah. pitch and continue play. <laughs> I think Osasuna got in trouble last season for doing that a lot. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I agree. I I haven't really seen that in any other leagues. It's very peculiarly uh, exclusive to La Liga, uh, and absolutely, I think that's something that really needs to be taken care of with some very serious fines. Because I've I've done that before. I've been that little you know, five year old <laughs> ball boy, and it's not a particularly tough job. There's oh, no you've done reason. you've done the boy. Oh, I thought you had done you had indulged into that. Oh movie. no 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 no. Oh, okay. I'm okay. not that evil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, the bottom line is, I guess that I'm kind of always afraid of uh, criticizing the ref because then Barca says, "Oh, here they go again with their ref problem." And you know, you saw what Xavi said, like basically, "Oh, they're so losers." So I guess that's our reputation. We we call them uh, cheaters, and they call us like um, how do you say like whiners, no, <laughs> for for ref uh, decisions. So well, at the end of the day, we have uh, we have a growing number of supporters in our decisions. Lots of Arsenal supporters absolutely agree with us when we complain about the refing against Barcelona. Lots of Chelsea so- supporters absolutely agree with us because you know they've been victim of the same thing. Wasn't it Van Persie just last season uh, yeah. got a got Red ejected card. from a game for uh, kicking a ball a quarter of a second after a whistle? Yeah, you know, yeah. That, and and those sorts of calls just seem to come in Barcelona's favor. Uh, you know, I really I'm of the strong opinion that I think they're very tactical in their decisions of how to pressure the ref to get their calls. I don't think it's just chance. I don't think that they're bribing the refs, but I think the Barcelona players are very keen to manipulate the referee in as many ways possible. So I I think the reason that we're always complaining about the referees is because there's always something to complain about. And you know what? That's what losers always do, you know? <laughs> Oh, That's what Barca always- did yesterday, actually. Well, I don't know if it was yesterday night or this morning that I read uh, Marca, Marca's uh, first page, and they were saying, one of Barca's players was saying something about the ref regarding their game v Villarreal. So I thought, huh, yeah, yeah. so when it's about you, you do complain too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, Messi, that's just Messi, part of the game. Yeah. It was Messi. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, what did I want to say? Oh, yeah. Regarding uh, Barca putting pressure on the ref, uh, something that just came to mind was how uh, the the ref booked Casillas, but he didn't book all the other, like, I don't know, 10 Barca players, probably just um, Valdez wasn't there, going after him. You know, remember that? Oh, yeah. And I was like, why is why why Casillas is getting the <laughs> the yellow card? They should all get one or none of them. But not just well. Casillas. And if if Casillas is to be believed, the only reason he came out of his box was to separate players. And that's you know, what I never, see. Yeah, that's what you, I see too. You know, you never you never want to card a player for doing that. Yeah, if the if the goalie is running, you know, outside of his box to get in the referee's face, absolutely yellow card him. I I highly support that. But when they're coming out of their box, especially on a situation that's 
really close to their box. Like, what was he, like, five meters outside of his box? It wasn't like, you know, the Valdez situation where he runs half the pitch to go yell hmm. at some. You know, it, it if he's just barely outside of his box and all he's trying to do is play, you know, peacekeeper and you give him the yellow and then don't penalize the, the Barcelona team for that same sort of thing, it, it really, it's disappointing. Uh, and, you know, I have every reason to believe him since he even – admitted in the same interview that I read that, that after the game, he said some things to the referees that he probably shouldn't have. And, you know, again, I can understand that. That's frustration. That's what people tend to do after they lose is get really frustrated and say things that they probably don't mean. But, yeah, it, it's absolutely absurd that he got that yellow card, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, but then again, if he hadn't come out of the box and... Uh... Been involved, I think Lars would have been sent off. Oh, you think that, uh, oh, that diverted the attention? Yeah, that diverted his attention. Yeah, that is what I think he wanted to do. And I think that's what he achieved in the end. So, I I don't know about that. that In, In my personal opinion, I feel like the ref was fairly consistent in not giving cards for hard tackles, uh, at least at that point in the game. You know, everyone claims, oh, Messi just got a card for the same thing. No, Messi got a card for coming in behind Pepe and basically just kicking the crap out of him. Like, there was no attempt to play the ball whatsoever. That was just taking a swing at Messi. Last was actually attempting to play the ball. Was it a clumsy challenge? Yes. Did it deserve a second yellow card? Absolutely not, in my opinion. Well, those are tough calls. If even us can't agree, <laughs> I imagine <laughs> the ref. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, it's it's always the case that that second yellow card takes something more than the first yellow card. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. always got to be a particularly nasty foul or particularly obvious foul or to, to get that second yellow card. And that just – it wasn't there. Lasana Diara, and I think uh, the Barcelona fans complaining about that and saying, like, oh, it's poetic justice that Ramos got thrown out for, you know, Busquets play acting because Lasana deserved to be out earlier in the game. It's, it, they're, they're full of it. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So now I think we're, we're done with the controversial topics. Um, I would like to discuss three players for their performances in the Copa del Rey. Carvalho, Altinto, and Granero, because they were maybe, um, you know, the least expected players, at least for me. Uh, I'm easy to surprise, I guess. But uh, I know, Aaron, you didn't like what Altinto did. So maybe you want to go first on him? I I mean, I'm not a fan of Altinto. Uh, you know, that much is, is obvious. I don't think he has the quality to be you know, a, a consistent member of our team. And I I think him playing is taking playing time away from other players who would be of a better benefit to the team, such as, you know, Sahin and, and Granero. Uh, but I, I thought, uh, I, I didn't think he played particularly poorly. I just thought his weaknesses were exposed. I just thought it became painfully obvious how he was not good enough for Madrid. Because the one thing he has is he has better technical ability than our other right-back options. You know, he's technically smoother with the ball than than Ramos or than Arbeloa or Lasana Diara or Contral. But that's that's all he's got. I, you know, I'm, I'm consistently amazed at how he has the ability to pass the ball to the other guy. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and like I said, I thought he was the weak point. I thought Barcelona was taking advantage of that the whole match, and I would be very pleased to see him uh, never donning our kit ever again. But unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, I, I don't hold against the guy. It's not his fault he got signed. It's maybe his fault a little bit that he was whining about not having enough playing time. And threatening to go to uh, the Greek League, which would have been fantastic in my book. But, uh, you know, it's, it is it is what it is. I thought he had a, 
he had a decent performance for his standards, but a subpar performance for Madrid standards. Okay, Tanuj, do you agree with that? <laughs> with those tough words? <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, because uh, in the Alton Top actually played in the first leg and wasn't even mentioned, uh, wasn't even part of the starting eleven or on the bench for the second leg. Uh, and in the first leg, I think from what our uh, very defensive uh, play, from what our very defensive uh, approach, I think he did a fair job. He was, it would be, uh, I don't know whether it would be fair to say, but uh, I think he was probably the best uh, performer in the first leg. He was good on the ball from whenever there was a, cha- there was a chance to move, move forward. And other than that, I think uh, the second leg he didn't play, obviously, so can't comment there. But other than that, I think he, he had a fair game. Nothing spectacular. But nothing uh, completely awful as well. Okay. All right. Well, I, yeah, I, fe- I, I tend to agree with you, Tanush. So, sorry about that. And <laughs> the, the only reason I think he was signed uh, was because he was a free agent in the summer. Uh-huh. And uh, Mourinho just grabbed the opportunity of having a backup option. Okay. Okay, and what about... I mean, oh, okay. All right. I, I, I totally understand the uh, benefit of having a squad player like that, but I feel like with our particular squad, we have cover for maybe everything but that uh, right back. And, and still, I feel like there's better ways to play the team so that we're not quite as exposed. But then again, I had a, a much lower opinion of him, so that's that, I suppose. All right. Uh, Tanuj, what about Carvalho? Uh, coming back after several weeks or even months for Clásico. And how did he perform, in your opinion? It was a very strange uh, choice to begin with. Because he hadn't played for weeks and then you suddenly throw in a 33-year-old to play in a Clásico. And mark Alex player, quick players like Alexis Sanchez and uh, Messi. So... A very difficult situation uh, to come back in. He was not that good. I mean, I'm just making it better for him by saying he was not that good because he was practically nowhere. He was no. I mean, there was there were no usual uh, crunching challenges from him or clearances which. He does quite often, and we saw them last season, but nothing in the first leg from him. Okay, Aaron? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I mostly agree. I think it was a little bit too soon to be bringing him back. Uh, You you know, uh, against Barcelona is probably the worst team to be bringing back a defender after a long injury layout. Uh, You know, I... I don't know who else to play there, though. Um, uh, v- Varan? Yeah. That, yeah, Varan. He's he's young, he's fantastic, but at the same time, you kind of have to protect him because, uh, you know, if he has one really bad performance that can terribly destroy his confidence, and he's definitely one for the future. He's definitely in our long, long-term plans if this club has any sense whatsoever. So I maybe would have liked to see him instead of Carvalho, but, you know, I I have to respect Mourinho for actually thinking long-term and wanting to defend and protect his young uh, prospect defender. So, yeah, it was probably too soon for uh, for Ricky, but those are the breaks. I don't think he played terribly. Uh, I don't think he was exposed too much because his positioning is still so fantastic that even without the pace, he was, he's able to do a decent job defending. And, you know, his, his partner definitely let him down in that first game. Okay. But yeah, with Pepe playing in a midfield, then who could have, I mean, it was a, it was a good thing that Carvalho was fit, no? Or, or yeah. was said to be fit. Because who who else could have played there? No, uh, uh, I mean aside from Varane, which I agree. I, I don't know if I want to see him in a classical like that. 
There was yep. nobody else. I mean, really, there there isn't, you know. Like, I think it, I, I have a feeling it's the the type of game and the type of formation that just meant he had to play. I don't know. Yep. Okay. Okay, and what about Granero for the second leg? I was really impressed. Um, I think he... Actually, I don't know that I was really impressed because that's what I sort of expect from Granero. I expect him to be really calm, really smooth on the ball. I expect him to be able to retain possession, and that's what he did, you know? Like, it was it was a, a couple seasons ago when he was on his... Uh, you know, it was effectively alone at, at Hetafe, and he played against Madrid, and he just frustrated the heck out of us because we were unable to get the ball off of him because, you know, he'd get the ball and it would just be a, a nice, calm little little spin of his body and he would shield the ball and, and we wouldn't be able to do anything about it. So it's nice to, to see him, you know, getting back in form for Madrid because he offers something different in the midfield. He's a little more athletic, a little more mobile than Javi Alonso. But he's got way more patience than a player like Lasana Diara or Sami Kadira. He's got better technical ability. He's better with passing the ball. He's got a better shot, you know. So he's kind of this like all action box to box kind of midfielder that we can hopefully foster into being a fantastic player uh, if he doesn't leave us. You know, I, I know there was a lot of rumors around him disappearing in the dran- January transfer window and, and Mourinho supposedly sat him down and talked to him and told him he had a place on the team. So it's it's really great to see, especially considering he's, you know, homegrown talent and that, that sort of stuff does matter, especially in the Champions League, that we have players like that available to us. Okay. Tanuj? I, I kind of agree uh, that my expectation of, I mean, there is from what I expect out of Granero, he was he was equal to it. I mean, the the hope, the chances that he uh, creates, the bo- the ball movement, the control over the ball, everything. Over the last three or four games that he has played in, he has just been his usual self of being a perf- being a perfect performer. So he was equal to it, I think. Okay. Uh, he almost, yeah. I'm sorry. He almost strikes me as kind of the Arbeloa of the midfield in that, you know, he's rarely going to have a game where he absolutely dominates like some of our other midfielders. But I, I'm not expecting him ever to go out there and have an absolute stinker. I'm expecting him to have solid sevens and eights performances every single time. And, you know, he's he's let us down sometimes in the past, but I think that's been – more of a function of him not having steady run of play than anything. So, uh, you know, I was totally surprised that he started to get this uh, this run of play. But, you know, I guess it makes sort of sense because this was right around the time that he had his uh, heart-to-heart with Mourinho and, and Mourinho made him promises about playing time. So it's good to see that Mourinho is following through on those uh, hypothetical promises. Yeah, that's, that was going to be uh, one of my next questions if you thought that he got uh, playing time to try and make him stay. Because what I heard last night was that it was almost a done deal with Betis for him uh, until Kedira's injury, apparently. That's what I understood. And also that they were uh, using him now uh, as a support for Alonso for um, because Alonso is being marked far too much now. So they were trying to, you know, get him as a as a help uh, for for play building. So that mm-hmm. those are the two things I I heard last night. So uh, definitely, but I think he's proving he's proving he has his spot on the team because I really liked what he did. I really liked it. Uh, okay, uh, anything you want to say about the way we approach the first leg is so defensively? I know that <laughs> Javi, for instance, was so, 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 so mad. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, in hindsight, I'm thinking it was a, a home game and with the uh, the goals um, worth twice as much, maybe they were going to... Mourinho wanted to keep a clean sheet. It didn't It didn't work. It backfired. But maybe it wasn't such a bad idea. Uh, I don't know. How do you feel about that? Tanuj, maybe you want to go first? Uh, 
I I kind of think he was going with the same approach he did with Inter when he was uh, when they played in the Champions League to just have a clean sheet in the first leg and then play defensively in the second only this time he did the bro- he did the wrong thing by playing defensively in the first leg just to preserve a lead and going all attack in the second leg if he had gone the opposite way that would have made more sense so his op- his complete uh, strategy of defending in the first leg especially at home was not the right thing we weren't playing the way we do we were probably playing just to adapt and uh, stop them rather than score which we did, which we tried more in the second leg so imagine if we had tried doing that in the in the first leg as well maybe the tie would have been won in the first leg and or maybe we would have been in a better position than what we were in okay i feel that aaron is jumping on his chair with a, like our redoing the match <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all the what ifs. I don't know. Mourinho is the kind of coach that uh, really enjoys when he can put situations where he has to win in 90 minutes. Um, you know, if he can, if he can get out of that first game uh, with very little decided, then he's going to be very pleased. You know, I think that's why he had his best success uh, in the Copa del Rey last season was because that was the time where we met Barcelona once, and those, you know. 90 minutes plus stoppage time is what decided the game. I think he feels most confident when he can go into situations like that. I don't think he uh, particularly prefers the two-legged approach. So I think that's absolutely what he was trying to do was just uh, you know make make that first game more of a skirmish than a decisive battle and and put all of his money on that that second match. Um, and you know I I don't know against. Against Barcelona, it's really tough for me to criticize because uh, there's just there's so many different things to try. Um, you know, I would have liked to see a different formation, but you know, a lot of Madridistas really support the idea of having uh, you know Pepe in the midfield against Barcelona because we've done so well when he's played that kind of shielding defensive midfielder role, and yeah. you know, just the rest of the personnel on the field. Uh, you, you know, it's 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 tough. Who else are you going to put on? What different formation are you going to play? I, I'm i not going to criticize him too heavily for that first match. Uh, I thought the spirit and drive was what was lacking, not the tactics and formations. Okay. All right. So uh, to finish up um, this first part of the Q&A, uh, what positive things do you... Do you get from from the second leg of the Clasico? Because yes, uh, you know we are out of the competition, but it was a tie. It wasn't a, uh, a loss. And also, I think I think in my opinion that we put an end to the the Barca mental block. So it wasn't a tie. Yeah, Yes, it was a tie. The second leg was a tie. Leg. Okay, yeah. No, Javi is like <laughs> second guessing me. <laughs> it was a, the second leg was a tie. It's just that it wasn't enough to get us through. So I think it put an end to the Barca mental block, in my opinion, and that's what I I get from it. What about you guys? Um, I don't think uh, we are still over the mental block because even though we drew the game and came back from behind. But until and unless I think we beat them, the the mental block would would still be there. If the only way we can get over the mental block is by winning. If we have, if we can get that belief in us in the in the players' head that we can win against them, that is the only way we can get over the block. Okay. Not by draws or marginally losing uh, in on an aggregate score. <laughs> I don't know. It was a draw in Camp Nou, you know. So that's why I feel like that it was wasn't at our stadium. But yeah, true. I mean, you, uh, it's uh, it's not easy to come back from two nil behind, especially when you're playing away to Barcelona at Camp Nou. But still, over over the period of 180 minutes, 
the mental block still exists that we can we weren't able to win the tie which i think if uh, if we had gone with a, an attacking approach we could have won that is what i think i mean the madridismo spirit is built on attacking play so why change that okay aaron you know i think in order to get over that block we're going to have to string together a couple wins a couple good performances in a row you know uh, cuz you know it was, it was like i posted on the uh, on one of these these post game um, articles it Madrid fans have a very short memory if they think Barcelona has been absolutely dominating us for the past couple of years. Because if you look back at that string of performances at the end of last season where we had Clasico after Clasico after Clasico after Clasico, we played them well. You know, uh, we, we, we won one, we tied one, we, we definitely tied in La Liga what did we do in Champions League? Didn't we lose one and tie one? Uh, uh, in the Champions we... League, we lost at home and then we drew away. Yeah, so we so we lost one and we drew one. So that's yeah. one loss, two ties, and one win over the course of the four games. And then, yeah, there's a Super Copa where, again, a, a lot of people thought we played them. Uh, particularly well, uh, at least for part of those matches. And, uh, you know, we didn't take home the Supercopa. Uh, but then, of course, in our last meeting in La Liga, was uh, a very disheartening loss. But at the end of the day, they really haven't been dominating as much as it feels like they have been. But we really have to string together a couple wins in a row to, I think, finally overcome kind of the uh, the inferiority complex that's infesting this team. And I thought, you know, the the best take home uh, of, of Wednesday's match was the fact that they didn't set a new record for most consecutive uh, wins against us. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, it was a good performance. We'll see what happens when we meet next. Uh, either in the Champions League or in La Liga. I, I think we're on the right track, but you know, it seems like every time we meet them, we're on the right track. We're the hot team, and somehow they're able to pull something out of their butts and completely ignore their form and beat us. You know, like Their away form this season has been atrocious, uh, yet somehow they pulled out one of their best games of the season against us in our house. I know, well, I know, because, you know, I think it was Alves being interviewed last last night after Villarreal, the game uh, Villarreal, and the interviewer says, like, yeah, you know, your away form is not very good, and I was thinking, yeah, except against us, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> Why is she saying that? <laughs> yeah. You know, at the end of the day, though, I am not as obsessed with Barcelona as I think Barcelona is with Madrid. You've seen in the past, like, they are just... Because they're, I mean, they're not quite as good as us, you know? They haven't won as many trophies as us. They haven't seen as much success. So they're always trying to poke and prod us, you know, and, and always trying to uh, to grab attention. At the end of the day, I don't care if if they beat us as long as we win that trophy. You know, if we yeah. end up with La Liga and we lose uh, against them in when we meet in in the league campaign, I, I wouldn't care at all. Okay. Now, Champions League, it might be tough to lose to them and still win it, so we're probably going to have to beat them. If we're we going to have to do that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I don't particularly care what our record is against Barcelona. I care what our what our trophy haul is. Okay, Tanuj, you too? Uh, yeah, I quite uh, find it really weird uh, that I was just checking uh, the Barcelona's results uh, by round. And before playing us uh, in December, they had only three away wins, which is very less as compared to what their uh, fantastic uh, uh, the, their home record has been, which I think is a La Liga record where uh, Valdez hadn't conceded a goal for many, many games. So, and the only game which I think I was most disappointed with 
our uh, classico uh, approach was the first leg of the champions league i mean we had the opportunity to to put them under the pressure we were the dominant side going into the game because i think before that we had won the copa del uh, the copa del rey yeah. and we were in a better position than what they were and still we went in with a with a very defensive approach i think that was the only game in the in the mourinho period i have been very disappointed with in the classicals that is okay well if you if you believe mourinho in his post game interview which i do because this is the strategy i i would have used is his decision for that game was to oscillate between uh, attacking aggression and and defensive recovery time. So you would press really hard, and then you would sit back for a little bit, and then you would press really hard. And I, I think, especially at that time, that was the best possible way to put Barcelona off balance. Because if you pressure them and chase them for the whole match, what's going to end up happening is you're going to get tired, they're going to stay fresh, and then they're going to beat you. And that's that's how they do it against most teams. So what Mourinho was planning on doing was, you know, pressuring for 10, 15 minutes, setting back, letting the legs recover, recuperate, pressing again and sort of a staccato, you know, no real rhyme or reason, just sort of happening almost at random kind of way. But then, you know, we get we get that uh, that that infamous card and suddenly the whole game goes to goes to crap. So. Uh, I don't really think it's – I mean, it, of course it's justified to criticize him because, you know, we're fans and that's what we get to do is, is criticize the coach after the fact. <laughs> but I, I don't think it's incredibly fair to criticize his strategy given the fact that we didn't get to see it play out over the course of the 90 minutes that he thought he had because of a red card that was not justified at all. Okay. Yeah, Mourinho tends to think that all all journalists and fans do are uh, is um, like second guessing him and criticizing him. <laughs> after after the second leg, he was um, uh, when when the journalist would ask anything, he would always say either I don't know, I don't want to answer, or but that's what you do. That's that's your job. That's not what I do. <laughs> Which was like okay, not very cooperative, but <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Well, it's like Di Stefano. I actually read. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was saying it, it's like Di Stefano said. You know, that's that's the job of of the supporters in the Bernabeu. You know, he was he was talking to Ronaldo at the time. But that's what they get to do. They're never wrong. They always get to criticize you. You know. Yeah. And, and yeah. Madrid or Mourinho is is aware of that. You know, he knows that in in football. The the fans and by extension the press is is always going to criticize you whenever you make any mistakes and even when you don't make any mistakes you know when mistakes are made against you they're still going to criticize you and that's just part of the game and you know I don't think he was being particularly snarky about that I thought he was just being honest which is kind of his defining characteristic but anyway I, I'm sorry can you I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you yeah what did you yeah, read. Um, that uh, Mourinho's press conference after uh, I think the Clasico or was it after the Bilbao game? I'm not really sure. I think it was after the Bilbao game. It lasted uh, only 10 minutes and it had about 20 odd questions and it was over in 10 minutes with responses like like the ones that you mentioned. I don't know. That's your job. You tell me. So <laughs> it's it's quite amusing when you're really reading about it or watching it. But coming from uh, his perspective, I think it, I I quite agree with uh, not answering or getting into the battle uh, of words because in the end, the media has probably more power over publishing things than I think what he has by saying things. Yeah. It's true. Hmm. Yeah. So we are with Aaron and Tanuj, uh, and we've okay. uh, finished discussing the, um, the Copa del Rey. We discussed a lot, actually. And so now we have about, I don't know, like 25 minutes uh, 
to discuss last night, okay? Okay. Okay, so the first thing I want to discuss about last night is actually somebody who wasn't on the pitch or anything. It's uh, Nuri Sain. Uh, were you surprised about him not even being on the bench? Yes, uh, 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 I was really surprised because I thought uh, uh, Sahin will be uh, featured on the bench, you know, but then uh, he was left out of the uh, so, actually, uh, Excuse me, sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. thank you. Yeah, uh, I thought uh, Nuri Sahin would actually start the game, but then I was a little surprised uh, to know that Nuri Sahin was uh, not even on the bench, you know, he was, he was left out of the squad completely. So, uh, yes, uh, it was a, a surprise to me. Okay, Tanur? Um, I'm not really sure whether I was surprised or I wasn't surprised because I have no idea why he isn't even part of the bench uh, for that matter. So, I'm, I'm still unsure of what I make of it because I have no idea why he isn't, why he isn't even being uh, considered for the spot. So, I'm indecisive as of right now. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, that given uh, Alonso's apparently apparent injury, could have been a good time for him to, to join the pitch. But since he wasn't even on the bench, <laughs> he couldn't have the opportunity. So, Aaron, what do you think about the, the sign case? The fact that he wasn't there and he could have had an opportunity last night? Well, I wasn't surprised, but I was disappointed. Um, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right that he could have had an opportunity, um, you know, but if you look at the bench, uh, there's nobody in particular that I would really, you know, say, oh, they, they shouldn't have been on there. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you could have, uh, dropped Contrao because you already have, you know, Arbaloa as a defender and yeah. you have yeah. Sahin as a, a midfielder to kind of replace that. You know, you also already had Lasana on the bench. But, you know, of the three subs, I, I can't really criticize him for any of those three. You know, I always love to see Calion coming on. Lasana Diara has been playing really well lately and deserves as much playing time as he can get. And Gonzalo Higuain is, is Gonzalo freaking Higuain. So it's, you know, he's he's never one to be uh, second guess being brought on the pitch. So, you know, even even if Nuri Sahin had made the bench, he, he could have very realistically not made the pitch. Um, I do really hope Mourinho is making concerted effort to bring him into the fold, though. Hopefully. Okay. One thing I realized was that since Granero was giving uh, some some time and uh, some you know uh, importance in the game now, maybe for Sahin it was going to be more difficult. But at the same time, I realized that um, players like uh, Ozil and Kaka, for instance, are played together. Or we have already seen Benzema and Iwain playing together. So, do you think there's room for both Granero and Sahin on the pitch at the same time? I don't know exactly. Um, I haven't seen you know Sahin play enough. Uh, I, I caught couple of his games for the Bundesliga last season, but, you know, we haven't really seen him play much this season. If he could step in and be very similar uh, as far as defensive positioning and such goes to Xavi Alonso, then absolutely I see no reason why we couldn't see, uh, you know, Sahin and Granero together. But if, if he can't do that, uh, I think it would take a formation change in order to see Granero and Sahin on the pitch at the same time. Because if they're both fairly offensive oriented, we can't have you know a four-two-four where our two are both attack-minded or at the very least you know not defensive-minded. Because yeah. when you only yeah. have two people in the midfield, they've got to be battling for balls. Otherwise, you just get overrun. But uh, yeah, it's it, it's possible. We just we haven't seen Nuri enough to to get a good read on it, in my opinion. Okay, Tanur. I quite agree. I mean, I've not seen uh, enough of Sain to to make a complete opinion on him and whether he would make a good pair with uh, Granero. Um, so I'm not really sure how it would fit, but. Other uh, possibilities could be uh, having Cointrao in the middle uh, with Granero, 
because Granero is more defensive minded and uh, sorry, uh, Cointra is more defensive minded and um, Granero can play both defensive and attacking, but has more uh, has is more inclined to attack than to defend. Uh, so it can work, but there there would be a formation change if it happens, and it would actually depend on whether. Uh, Alonso is indeed injured or not. So, given that Mourinho has given two days off to the entire squad, maybe he would recover from it because he went directly into the tunnel at the end of the game. Yeah. So, maybe he would just recover and there is nothing to worry about. Okay. Apekshit? Uh, well, I frankly think that it's possible, but then it's not uh, likely to happen, now, you know. And uh, I'm yet to see uh, Sahin play for us. No, I've, I've seen a couple of his uh, videos on YouTube and uh, he, he looks like a real talent, uh, you know. But then I am uh, get to see him, so I uh, cannot say much about him. Okay, all right. So somebody we can talk about, I think, is uh, Ozil. Uh, he's been great in Copa del Rey, I think. He's been great last night. Uh, goal and assist. Uh, we were saying that he wasn't the type of player who could last 90 minutes and he's been proving us wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, are, are you happy with him being back? I think we can almost uh, talk of, I mean, say it's a comeback for him. Maybe, Apache, do you want to go first? Yes, sure. Uh, yeah, without a doubt, uh, we can say that uh, Mesut is back. You know, he's a, he's a magician and uh, he's been performing very consistently for us. And the third goal that he scored yesterday was a piece of a goal, you know. Even though it was a little bit of a mistake by the keeper, he was beaten at his near post. But then, uh, you shouldn't take credit away from uh, Matthew for trying, you know. And he scored a very good goal. And, and his passing also has been amazing, you know. Playing those two balls with the strikers. So, uh, he has been playing very, very consistently. And I remember he came very close to uh, scoring a an amazing goal against Barcelona. The ball just came off the crossbar. So I thought I had yeah. a little bit of luck being on his side, he probably would have scored it, you know, and things uh, perhaps would have been a little different. Uh, but then he has been really, really consistent, and I hope that uh, he will keep going you know, for us. Okay, okay, make sure you speak uh, loud and clear, actually, because sometimes I have trouble hearing you. <laughs> Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Uh, Aaron, you want to go next about Azil? I mean, I love the, the market cover that had, you know, Wizard of Oz on yeah. there. I, I thought that was fantastic. I think, yeah, he's definitely just returning to form. I mean, we all know he's a, a fantastic footballer. We've seen him do some really great things for this team in the past. And, you know, he hit a little bit of a slump, and, and he, he has it. He's rarely shown his ability against Barcelona, so it was nice to see. You know, in that Sopa, second Copa del Rey game, him really come alive and really dominate that match like he's able to do. Uh, you know, and, and he's he's carried that form on into La Liga, and it's fantastic to see, but not surprising at all. You know, he, he's a fantastic player. Yeah, but he was a little, you know, um, subdued, I want to say, for the last few months. So... I, I realized that, you know, in in previous games where he was quote-unquote subdued, he would, like, pass the ball very fast, like, almost like he didn't want to have the ball. I mean, that's that's a bad reading of what he was doing, but that, that's the impression I, I was getting. And he would uh, lose a lot of balls to, like, miss passes and stuff. And on the other hand, when he is apparently very, uh, feeling very well and very confident, he takes the ball, he dribbles, uh, he he makes uh, really great passes with great timing, so it's a whole other you know a whole other experience to watch him when he's confident and when he's not. I feel. Yeah, I mean he's a young player. He's still growing, and and part of part of that thing that you really hope he develops is is an ability to limit the damage when he's off form and maximize the amount of time that he's on form. You know. Yeah. Okay, Tanush. I. I, I, I I find it uh, very difficult uh, to understand when we say that, like when you said that he was subdued in the past few months, because I like to go with stats and numbers, and uh, Ozil has second most assists assists in the league, uh, right behind Di Maria, who's injured, and I 
it's just i think uh, we have discussed this on this uh, q and a before that our uh, that our expectations of ozil is just a little too much i think sometimes where we think that he ha- that he should provide killer balls and um, and play wonderfully in each game so i sometimes i think we go a little too over expectant with ozil but i think i went a little overboard by suggesting that he could be the left footed zidane of right of the current generation so i wonder how many people agree with that but uh, with but some of his touches and passes do remind me of zidane's control and ability as well so that's okay. my comparison so what about you guys i think she and aaron do you agree with tanuj on this well yes i think uh, uh, what he just said is uh, is right you know because ozil he has set himself a very high standard you know and uh, when he fails to meet uh, meet that high standard of his we always say that uh, he was not good you know but in the last few games he has been really really good but the one thing which i still want to see uh, is when he loses the ball he should just try and track back you know but the players with player like uh, messi they they don't do it you know but then once he starts uh, doing it i think it would be great for him but do you agree about the the comparison with zidane uh i'm not too sure about it no i'm uh, not too sure about it <laughs> aaron because oh because, sorry go ahead yeah because uh, i think uh, zidane uh, he was just one of a kind you know i don't think uh, i don't think uh, messi can actually match him because zidane was Zidane was in a league of league of his own, you know. Okay. Well, I uh, I disagree. I think uh, Messi will be able to match Zidane. I don't know. He'll he he will be able to. I don't know that he will. Um, you know, he's he's got the same kind of skill set, and it's it's going to be really interesting to see how he grows as a player. Because remember, he's still very young. He's still. is is very inexperienced at this uh top level so i expect to see him continue to grow continue to mature and and i hope he does reach the level of Zinedine Zidane who could you know dominate the pitch every time he stepped on it whether he was in good form bad form he still had the ability to to make that difference at any moment and if if we could have our little wizard of oz do that i would be more than pleased Okay. Uh, um, just to add one more thing in my defense, if somebody disagrees with me, uh, <laughs> I, I still don't. I I don't think Ozil is still able to be uh, is able to take a team on his own, like what Zidane used to do. I mean, he can't carry a whole team on his shoulders and and progress to 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 the end of the tournament like. Zidane did with uh, France in 2006 World Cup. Yeah. So I don't think Ozil don't is still. Don't remind me of that World Cup, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, just uh, just uh, the whole World Cup, not the Matarazzi incident. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think Ozil is still there, but I I think he can reach that level if he if he is able to progress the way. uh he is progressing right now all right uh well i would like to know also what you think of uh, benzema then because i was going to say <laughs> a bit the same thing i was going to say benzema wow he set you know very high standards for himself and lately i find him a little quote unquote subdued and so i wonder if you're going to say the same thing you know that we are we have such high expectations of him that when he's a little under those expectations we we find him disappointing so but um i agree with you not at all <laughs> <laughs> you knew i was going there yeah. uh so I, he wasn't he was a little off yesterday but uh i think uh, he was really good uh, against uh, barcelona in the second leg he scored a peach of a goal the second one to to control the ball and then uh, con- and then go place it over uh, the defender 
chip it over the defender and then control it all over again and then slot it past the keeper it was just fantastic to see so, i agree i agree with that yeah i do so he was a little off yesterday but overall he has been great this season okay apekshit well i think uh, yesterday it was a really bad day for uh, uh, benzema you know because he looked completely uh, disinterested uh, but then uh, he has been really consistent in the past few games you know and uh, uh, the goal which uh, uh, which my friend tanuj was actually referring to was a cracker of a goal you know uh, not not many people can do that to carlos puyol you know technically it was a very brilliant goal that he scored so i uh, i feel that uh, Benzema he just needs to be consistent you know he just consistently uh, needs to score okay aaron i'm going to disagree i thought benzema had a decent game uh yesterday i i didn't think it was his best game uh at all but i thought i thought he had a decent outing you know i thought he did the right things with the ball i thought he he made the right runs i i would like to see him score that header early on in the match yeah. but You, you know, I I thought he had a, a a decent performance, you know, and I think he's the kind of player that's built so that even if his form isn't blistering hot, he's still able to contribute to the team because he just has all that calm and and patience on the ball, you know. Mm-hmm. He, uh, if I remember correctly, he played a, a decent part in the build up to uh, Cristiano Ronaldo's goal. Yes, yes. So, you know, he he definitely contributed to the team yesterday and. I just I I I would be very hesitant to say he had a subdued match yesterday. I I thought he had a uh it was a letdown in his form, but that's only because he had such a blistering match against Barcelona. All right. Well, that's a good uh, uh, I, good sum up. Oh, but a pick it disagrees. <laughs> yeah, can I can I just say something? Can I Of say course, yes. <laughs> yeah, um uh, Well, the one thing that I would uh, like to say is that Benzema got a start yesterday, you know, and he he did not make the most of it. Uh, next game, probably uh, he's not going to start, so it's going to be tough for him to actually come on and score, you know, because I don't think he's going to get more than twenty uh, five uh, minutes, you know. So I think it's going to be tough for him to actually come on and uh, uh, score in the next game, you know. So I thought he uh, did not uh, quite make the uh, full use of his start uh, that he got yesterday. Okay. Anybody wants to say anything about that? I don't know. I think he can uh I think he's a, a very decent super sub. I think he will do just as well as Iguain coming off the bench if not better. And I think Mourinho is finally starting to realize that rotation is a very good policy. So, you know, yes, he probably won't start the next game, but he's probably going to start the game after that. All right. Uh, another player I want to talk about is Kaká because he scored and assisted last night but at the same time uh I've been feeling that uh he was a bit off lately um I I so I really like him he seems like a really really nice guy and very very talented obviously so you we would want to see that in Madrid so but then if you go by the stats like Tanur likes to Uh, remind me of then uh, last night was a good game because he scored an assistant. So I don't know how do you feel about his game and his uh, form lately. I thought uh, I thought he had a decent game. Um, I, you know, I am very pleased that he's able to produce even decent games because for a while there he looked to be dead weight. Um, so it's it's nice to see him. finally starting to return to form finally starting to contribute to this team a little bit more and i i hope to see that continue you know i hope to see him shake off a bit of the rust and and really show us what kaka is able to do uh but uh, you know i i kind of agree with you i think he he didn't have the best game yesterday but i thought at the end of the day he had a goal he had an assist you know that's more than most of the players on the pitch can say Tanur uh I think in the in the early uh, part of the game he was a little invisible but 
as the game progressed he started to get a, get a part of the game and uh, that is when he that is when he scored and provided an assist as well so early on he was a little uh, off i think but as the game progressed he started to come back into it and it's good to see that he's finally getting back into position and uh, his usual self and uh, the pairing of ozil and kaka is um, is a very interesting one because both are able to change uh, flanks and uh, provide uh, um, provide flavor into the midfield as well mm-hmm. so so i think the it would be very interesting to see who will uh, start when di maria is back whether there would be a change in uh, in posi- in positioning or whether uh, the this, these two will continue to uh, uh, continue to start for us it would be it, it's a good thing that we have options but whether it makes uh, it continues to result in goals is also another important thing to see okay apekshit yeah well i thought kaka was decent last night but uh, he did miss a couple of uh, very good chances you know i remember that he missed the header you know it was a very good uh, chance and he uh, he just missed it you know and uh, he has been a shadow of himself to be uh, to be really frank with you uh, you know i've seen several videos of his uh, when he used to play for milan you know he used to just go past people pick the ball up from halfway line and go past three three four defenders and finish you know so uh, i know uh, he has had problems he has had uh, serious problems with his knee but then i would uh, want to see him back in form you know and when he gets back in form i think uh, he's going to get much faster than what uh, what he is now you know uh, he's 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 fast now there's there's no doubt about it but i think he's he's still missing or lacking that uh, extra yard of pace you know so when he gets it back i think he's he's going to be better so i just uh, want to see him perform consistently you know and i'm i'm very sure that he's he's more than uh, more than capable of doing it okay uh and last player i want to uh put the focus on uh is cristiano because well not only has he scored in copa del rey uh, against barca so that was a good thing to see uh also he seems i don't know maybe maybe it's me just reading into things again but i'm seeing a change in attitude because usually when he's fouled and and the referee doesn't call the foul on him he's like laying on the floor i mean on the ground waiting for things to happen uh, but lately he's just getting up and tracking back running defending so that's really nice to see um what 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 do you think about all that aaron maybe you want to go first oh well- Yeah, I mean I think uh Ronaldo is a bit moody to be perfectly honest. I think he goes through stretches of time where he, you know, puts in a, a lot of effort and and runs up and down the pitch and you know, seeing him uh especially some of his defensive contributions uh, against Barcelona. Like you know, he got that yellow card for that perfectly clean tackle. I was really impressed with his uh sliding tackle on on uh I think it was Alaves had the ball. Um you know it he he seems to be doing that i i don't think it's going to last i think he will be back to his petulant ways eventually but i don't think those petulant ways will last either i think he'll he'll sort of oscillate in between these different modes and moods and personalities so uh yeah it's it's just it's nice to see him back scoring goals again because i think he's happiest when he's doing that surprisingly yeah. okay apexit Yeah, well it was quite a surprise to see uh, Ronaldo back on his feet and uh, uh, trying to win the ball back again after uh, Ronaldo was fouled. You know, it was it was really a, a very good uh, change to see uh, to be uh, to be really frank with you, you know, because I I I keep talking about it, you know, uh, that he he whines a little too much, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and his goal also yesterday was uh, I mean it it wasn't a very difficult one. Uh, it was a simple tap in, but then yes, the uh, right man at the right place at the right time. and uh, i would just like to point out to the fact that yesterday uh, uh, he was again wasteful when it uh, when it came to free kicks you know i remember he took about three uh, free kicks in the game and uh, uh, not even one free kick actually uh, hit the target you know so i think when he's taking free kicks he uh, he should at least make it a point to uh, test the keeper okay tanur um the best thing i've noticed in the past 
two games from Ronaldo is the track back. Uh, even when he's losing the ball, he's coming back and recovering the ball. And one incident I remember perfectly is when uh, he he uh, he tackled uh, Messi to the ground, and uh, which resulted in a corner for Barcelona. That was good to see that he was helping out the defense and not just standing in front and uh, waiting for the ball to be presented to him or waiting in midfield to continue with play. So that was good to see. And yesterday's goal, as a picture said, right place, right time. So that was good to see that he's scoring. And uh, I'm still uh, a little hesitant of his free kicks because they have dipped in uh, quality of late. So, he still, I think, needs to work on that. And as far as helping out his defense is concerned, uh, he's doing that. So, I'm happy with that. All right. Uh, I think uh, Aaron is close to having to leave us. So I Yeah, just... I was actually just about to say something. I probably have to, to run now, guys. But it's it's been great talking to you. Okay, well, thank you yeah. very, very much for being with us today. Of course, I look forward to uh, listening to the rest of the conversation. Okay, well, have a nice day. That's still a, a long part of the day for you, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, we're right about noon here. All right, guys, take okay, care. Okay, thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Okay, guys, um, so Tanuj uh, Napekshit. The next thing I wanted to discuss was, was the offside rule. So... There are two things I want to discuss about that. First of all, uh, you know, uh, Cristiano's goal, uh, at first I thought it was offside, and I know um, Zaragoza's uh, um, coach thought so too, because he said so in the press conference. And then the journalists analyzed it with their special tools and stuff, and they said uh, two different things. And so now I'm confused as to why it wasn't offside. Some people said it wasn't offside because at the time uh, it was uh, Ozil, I think, who got the ball. Uh, Cristiano was behind the defenders. And then other people said it's because at the time uh, Cristiano, uh, at the time Ozil passed the ball to him, Cristiano was behind the ball. So I'm all confused about what's going on. So if one of you can clarify the, this. That would be great. Um, let me have a crack at it. Uh, uh, I think it was offside, but offside by an arm. Because uh, when us has an image of the incident on its website, so uh, they have drawn a line when Ozil does, when Ozil passes the ball uh, for Ronaldo. And and when the ball is passed and the line is drawn there, Ronaldo is ahead and just by an arm while the rest of his body is back in line when the ball is passed behind the ball, that is. Okay. So, as per, as per the offside rule, you, you have to be, be either in line with the ball or behind the ball to be counted as onside. And Ronaldo's part of the body was onside and his arm was offside. So as per the offside rule, I think even though this is a tricky one, I think uh, it was offside for me. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't think it was, uh, I mean, it was fair and square, you know, because uh, Messi went past the last defender and after that, uh, Ronaldo uh, received the, pa- uh, the ball from him, you know. So Ronaldo was actually behind the ball uh, when he uh, received the pass, uh, you know, from uh, Messi. So I think it uh, uh, wasn't offside, uh, uh, and it was a fair and square goal. Okay. Uh, one thing I had heard also was when the part of the body that is offside um, is not a part of the body that you can score with, then it's fine. Like you cannot score with your arm, right? You can score with your head or your feet, not with your arm. So therefore, if your arm is offside, then it's it's good. You're onside. You know what I mean? Yes, that's right. Uh, That's the rule, actually. But it, again, depends. It uh, basically comes down to uh, the perception of the linesman, you know. Because I'm not very sure whether the linesman also uh, follow the same rule, you know. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I think they they need to follow the... They need All of them, they need to sit down, first of all, you know, and uh, come to a consensus, uh, you know. 
so when uh, this happens i think uh, we'll we'll also uh, uh, get to see uh, consistency in the game you know all right okay i i'm not really sure about the rule because uh, from what i've seen in many games is that even though your a part of your body is uh, offside you are counted as offside even if it is your arm your leg or whatever hmm. it is offside if it, it's part of your body and it's and it's interfering with play as it is termed in uh, offside rules and there was no uh, there was no player uh, there was no defender nearby him as well so there was no uh, no chance of uh, being behind the last defender also because ronaldo was clearly in front of the last defender only he was in line with the ball when it was passed which is fine by the rule but his part of the body was in front of the ball which is not fine by the rule okay so yeah you know that's a tricky thing the offside i was trying to explain the the concept to a friend of mine who's american and and doesn't know um soccer and i was like okay so that's a tricky concept and trying to explain and then i realized that myself i get confused also but if even you know if even the the um, the linesmen and the, the referees are not clear on what the rule is exactly then how can we explain it to somebody <laughs> yes that's very true yeah. <laughs> okay and uh apexit if we can finish on the offside rule remember we had something pending uh there was this uh, goal i don't remember who that was do you remember we had something pending about the offside rule uh yeah but then i'm not uh I'm not quite able to uh, recollect the context. Yeah, you know. yeah, me neither. Yeah. Okay, so we'll leave it aside, and uh, I'll yeah. I'll dig into our site and try to find what it was because I remember there were a series of comments about it. So I'll find that yeah. for next time. Okay. okay. Um, your man of the match last night, Tanuj. Maybe you want to go first. Uh, I had a hard time picking between uh, Granero and uh, Ozil for yeah. the man. for the man of the match um, but if i had to i would go with ozil mostly because he got a goal and provided an assist okay that was that is the only reason why i would pick him over granero okay for me it has to be without a shadow of a doubt messi the magician <laughs> yeah so i guess the three of us agree on this one i don't know what uh, aaron would have said maybe he'll tell us in the comments but yeah i agree too okay and so my last question and then we i let you guys uh, go uh, and i know tanush you have your podcast merenge bites to 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 do now uh yeah. have you lost excite i mean i mean has your interest in the other competitions we have list watered down after being uh, eliminated from copa del rey that's the question i have <laughs> that's not very inspiring <laughs> i I'm, i'm actually uh, i'm actually not sure what the question is i didn't understand it fully to be honest okay do, do you are you still excited or still looking forward to the liga matches uh even though you know we're out of copa del rey because the liga is still you know a long a long competition there are still many matches ahead of us copa del rey is kind of a more instant gratification so it is the fact that we are out of the copa something that affects your excitement when it comes to watching real madrid games or you know you're just over it and now you focus on the rest of the games to be honest i'm just happy that copa del rey is over Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, the only this gives us uh, no more uh, uh, midweek games other than Champions League to play. So we don't have the semis to look forward to or uh, the final to play. So it is good for uh, for the squad to stay fresh while the likes of Barcelona, uh, Bilbao, and Valencia have other things to concentrate on. So I think it doesn't affect my excitement for La Liga because uh, since 1993 uh, up until last year we hadn't won the Copa del Rey so okay that does that doesn't bother me at all so I'm quite relieved that it's over <laughs> <laughs> That that's a nice I didn't expect it <laughs> Okay I'll take it 
yeah when i completely drink to that you know uh, copa del rey i mean it's not i mean it's a big uh, uh, tournament you know but then i don't think it is as big as the la liga and the champions league you know okay so yeah i think uh, uh, i think nothing has changed you know i uh, just think that we just need to keep our focus now now we have a, a lead of 7 points in the la liga and uh, we are in a decent position in the uh, champions league also you know we have made it to the uh, knockout round so i think uh, uh, we should just try and win these two trophies and uh, should we pull it off i think it, it's going to be a great season for us okay all right well thank you very much guys uh, i think we can we can finish here unless you want to add in something else yes yes, yes yes can i can i just add something yes of course yeah uh, i would just like to talk a little bit about the first goal that we actually conceded yesterday okay uh, yeah yeah the first goal that we conceded was a complete uh, defensive lack uh, you know pepe switched off kesias of all people i mean it was a very very uh, big surprise to me kesias was uh, uh, caught in no man's land you know and uh, uh, zaragoza took it uh, quickly you know that that free kick was taken really really quickly so i think the such uh, defensive lapses uh, are, are going to cost us you know because uh, if pepe and kesias both uh, switch off i think it's it it's going to be very very dangerous for us so okay. i think yeah defensively i think we we need to get better we need okay. to get a whole better yeah oh excuse me yeah all right yeah tanuj that's actually actually something i read on your site right you were saying that it was a bit uh worrisome that we were being scored uh right? we were receiving goals in most of our games now uh, before we scored ourselves right uh yeah i think uh, in the last four games we have conceded an early goal in the first 15 minutes if i'm not wrong and then gone on to either draw with barcelona and or win in la liga that we did so it's a it's good to come back and draw or win but it's not a good position to be in after just 15 minutes so especially yesterday it was a complete defensive lapse and i don't really blame eker for it because uh, his defense left him in no man's land as as uh, apixit said so it wasn't uh, eker's fault but rather the defense which probably went off to sleep as always no <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> we both you you both agree on the on the fact that it was our defense has to improve so yeah. okay yeah. all right anything else good thing we are actually defending uh, the set pieces better and we didn't concede any goals of headers recently yeah so at least on that front we are positive so that's just taking a positive out of a negative i think yeah that's good that's the spirit <laughs> <laughs> okay mm-hmm. all right well i i don't want to um to keep you uh, any longer tanush because i know you have Uh, something else to do so just i want to thank you both and aaron who left earlier for being with us today and thank uh, the people who listen to us for listening uh, i think this is going to be a very long podcast maybe we'll split it into two uh, so yeah thank you very much and talk to you very soon thank you so much bye 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 <laughs>